Chapter 8. The sun coming through the open church windows woke them up earlier than they would have liked. But even without the sun, the people shuffling around and babies crying would have gotten them up anyway. It took a few blinks for Jaime's eyes to focus, and a few more for his brain to register what the church looked like. To say it didn't compare to the church in Tapachula would be like saying a rock wasn't like a rainbow. The two had absolutely nothing in common. This one had a natural skylight where the roof had caved in, no paintings, and a crucifix that was little more than two branches tied together into a cross. Patches of the stone walls were missing. Dust crumbs from the wall next to Jaime and Angela clung to the tattered blanket. Bits of cloth were sewed together to make a curtain in the middle of the room, separating them from the men. In the thick humidity, body odor mingled with dirty diapers and whiffs from the polluted river occasionally joined forces. When Jaime grabbed his shoes, a black cockroach scurried from the laces to find a new hiding place. And then there were the people. About 50 women and children crammed into their half of the church, making it hot and stuffy despite the draft. On the other side of the curtain there were probably just as many men. Or more. Is everyone here going to El Norte? Jaime asked Angela as he gave his shoes a good thump before putting them on. May, am I, you know? Angela looked around at the women and children waking up. Gangs like the Alphas are all over Central America. Jaime stopped to think about it. If there were about 100 people here in this one little church, in a little town, how many other immigrants were there in other refugee centers throughout Mexico? There must be thousands, maybe even tens of thousands, heading to El Norte every day. That couldn't be right. He must be adding it up wrong. Miguel had been the one good at math. On the other hand, Jaime's logic made perfect sense. Even if only half of them make it across the border which we know is very hard. How can one country fit so many extra people? Angela licked her lips as if she didn't want to think about that. That's why they're building a wall. I saw a picture of a fence going into the ocean. They say it's to keep their country safe, but really it's to keep us out. Jaime recalled a couple of photos that Tomas had sent of the ranch land where he worked, pastures and mountains with no buildings as far as the eye could see, so different from home, where houses clustered together with banana trees growing between them like weeds. True. El Norte was huge, and there were some empty parts. But how long would the land stay empty, especially if there were thousands sneaking in each day? He knew they were unwanted, unwelcome. He could only hope that there'd be some room left in the world for him and his family. He followed his cousin through the thick tropical growth to the river, where they kept watch for each other before returning to the church hall. Mangos or tamales? Angela looked through their food bags, or there's still some tortillas and a tiny bit of cheese. If only Abuela had packed the breakfast she had made yesterday. They definitely enjoyed it more today. Jaime's stomach groaned and ached as he remembered home. Tortilla with mango, and we might as well finish the cheese too, I guess. A girl close to Angela's age with a baby slung around her chest and handbag hanging from her shoulder looked up as she folded her tattered blanket. The church provides us with food. She spoke with an accent that implied Spanish hadn't been her first language. She didn't look Mayan. Jaime wondered if she was Zinka or Pipil Indian instead. Angela smiled and waved hello at the baby. Thank you, but we're already grateful for the shelter. We shouldn't take when we are, when we already have. The baby reached out to Angela with thin arms. The mother hesitated for a second before passing the baby over. Save what you have and go to the table anyway. Tomorrow we could all be starving. Jaime and Angela looked at each other. The girl had a point. They only had food for another day or so, and then what? Even if they boarded the train today, it could easily be a week before they got to Tomas or more. Tennis Rosson, Angela colloquial agreed with the woman as if she were talking to a girlfriend, not the formal way she had spoken with the guard on the bus. We'll eat what God provides. Jaime remembered Cuico's plump belly and chubby cheeks that broke into a smile and tickled. In comparison, this baby seemed frail and small. Angela rocked her for a few more seconds before handing her back. The girl pulled her baby close. They both giggled as the girl burrowed her face into the tiny tummy. She adjusted the infant into some rags that worker that worked as a carrier against her chest. Better take your food with you and your other belongings. Things grow legs when you're not watching. Gracias. Jaime hugged the backpack to his chest. If anything happened to his sketchbook. The girl turned in a circle to give her sleeping spot one last check. The blanket she had used lay perfectly folded in a corner. Are you leaving now? Angela frowned. Her father, the young woman, looked down at her baby with a sad smile, tried to take her away from me. I can't let him find us. It was then that Jaime noticed the bruises on the girl's arm, the cut almost hidden under her hair, and her feet wrapped in scraps of cloth instead of shoes. 
Although she looked nothing like them, it wasn't too hard imagining her as Angela, if only they could help her. From their plastic food bag, Angela took out one of Abuela's tamales, wrapped in banana leaves and a mango that had grown behind Jaime's house, and handed them to the young woman with the baby. For tomorrow. The cousins folded up the bed blankets and returned them to Viejita, who placed them on a stack before they were allowed outside. A grumpy woman with dark, thick braids served breakfast on a long table under some trees near the river. Her gruff glare deterred anyone from asking for second helpings. Not that anyone would. Breakfast consisted of lumpy cornmeal cereal and soupy pinto beans, both of which tasted like nothing. I miss Abuela's cooking, Jaime said under his breath, though the snicker of agreement from Angela meant she had heard and agreed. If they were home, they'd have fried plantains, sweet bread, and sausages. Even when money was tight, there were always eggs from their chickens, fruit from the trees, and an endless supply of savory black beans. Jaime took more bites, imagining the food had salt, sugar, or lard, something to make it less bland. When the plastic plate lay empty on the ground in front of him, he knew Abuela would be proud. He had feeling he had a feeling that picky eaters wouldn't survive this trip. About a hundred people ate their breakfast on the ground under the shade of avocado trees, picked bare of any fruit, grown men in various shades of tiredness. Women clumped together, keeping their heads down and avoiding attention. Quite a few children and teens, mostly without their parents. Some people were barefoot. Some sported raw bruises on their faces. Some looked like their soul had left their body, and all that was left was a corpse operated by memory. Jaime closed his eyes for a second and said a prayer of thanks. He had. He wrapped his knuckles against the avocado tree he was leaning against. Angela. They had food and money, and they had their health. Compared to the others huddled around this ruined church, they could be in much worse conditions. Bright and perky for so early in the morning, Padre Kevin walked among the travelers, asking how they had slept and if they needed anything. When one teen in a cap said he needed café con leche, eggs, and a side of bacon, Padre Kevin pressed his hands together in prayer and then reminded him that stranger miracles had happened. The Padre came up to Jaime and Angela with a huge smile. He must have gotten less sleep than they had. But there he was, fully alert, freshly shaven, and in hot pink shorts and a t-shirt with a picture of Jesus and the English words, Who's your daddy? Ah, if it isn't my midnight chapin, chapinas, he said, using the colloquial word for Guatemalans, and welcomed them each with a traditional greeting, cheek kiss. How did you sleep in my luxurious house of God? He raised his arms with pride to embrace his rundown church. Very well, thank you, Angela said as she set down her finished plate. We appreciate you letting us stay here. Padre Kevin looked up at the hazy grayish blue sky with a sense of tranquility as if Angela were thanking the wrong person. Of course. And how long do we have the pleasure of your company? You can stay as long as you like. How may and Angela exchanged looks? That part of the plan was still vague. Last night, Padre Kevin had said there was always room, but maybe he wasn't good at math and didn't realize how full the church already was. We need to get in contact with a man called El Gordo, Angela said. Do you know where we can find him? Padre Kevin's perky grin changed to a frown as his eyes shifted among the crowd. You won't find him. He'll find you. He knows we're here, Jaime asked. The feeling of being watched made him shiver. He glanced at the bushes behind him, just to be sure. He'll be around the day before the, the train comes in. Padre Kevin suddenly seemed tired. Have you already paid him? Angela nodded. Our parents have. Jaime slipped his thumbs into his jeans waistband without realizing what he was doing. When he did, guilt overtook him. The money, the sacrifice his and Angela's parents must have gone through to get everything ready in a few days, just for their safety. They gave us everything they had, and more. Jaime sent another prayer to his family, sending his love and thanks. He just hoped their sacrifice was worth it. He hoped he didn't end up like Miguel. Hmm, well, that's that. Padre Kevin looked like he wanted to say more about El Gordo, but instead turned to greet the next group of people. Wait, Angela got to her feet. When is the next train? When will El Gordo come? Padre Kevin's face twitched as if his brain were fighting for control against his mouth. Next train's in two days, so he'll be here tomorrow afternoon. Make sure you are too, or you'll lose your money. When he welcomed the people sitting next to them, his previous perkiness was missing from his tone. What should we do today? Jaime asked as he and Angela walked back to the table to return their plastic-colored plates. Angela looked around as if she too wondered whether they were watched from the dense bushes. I don't know. We don't know how safe it is here. Remember the graffiti? But I don't like staying still, either. Good. He didn't want to wander around the town. After all, Miguel had been killed in broad daylight in the village they'd lived in their whole life. Who knew what could happen in this unfamiliar place? 
Before Jaime could make some suggestions, guess the drawing, quiz each other on movie trivia, or walk through the thick bushes lining the river in search of smooth stones for a game of marbles, the grumpy woman at the food table yanked the plates out of their hands. You can help around here. That's what you can do. This isn't a hotel, you know. Things don't just magically get done. Of course not, Angela said, sounding surprised and offended. Back home, everyone always helped however they could. It was what families did. Yeah, well, the woman's voice softened a bit when they didn't complain or argue. Jaime wondered if most people tried to get out of helping or never thought of volunteering. Padre always forgets to mention it when he makes the rounds. He seems to think that help should be given willingly and not because one feels obligated. But then I'm left doing it all by myself. Jaime nodded. What can we, what can we help you do? Dishes for one thing, and you three, she shouted at the boys behind them, who were also returning their empty plates. You're helping with the dishes as well, and don't let me catch you stealing anything from the kitchen. Just like Jaime and Angela, the boys didn't challenge the idea of helping out in exchange for food and shelter. Or maybe they were too scared. The youngest boy definitely flinched a bit. The woman's gruff, don't mess with me tone, had returned. The tallest boy looked vaguely familiar, with his ruffled black hair and dark skin, but Jaime didn't know from where. The boy picked up a stack of the dirty plastic dishes from the ground next to the table and carried them into separate, decaying wooden building that operated as a kitchen. They all followed him without another word. The kitchen held two large steel wash basins with tubs underneath the drain and a stove with six burners but no refrigerator. Bags of rice, beans, and ground corn sat under rickety shelves that held plates and pans. In a corner, a swarm of flies buzzed around a huge banana bunch. Jaime got the feeling he was looking at the lunch menu. Once in the kitchen and away from the grumpy woman, Angela and Jaime set their bags in a corner. The older boy placed the dishes in a wash basin and turned to Angela. Hola, Veracruz, he said. Angela looked surprised. It took Jaime a second to understand what the boy was talking about, and suddenly it hit him. He had been on the bus with them yesterday, sitting up front and playing with his phone. Unlike the guard, he seemed he wasn't fooled. It seemed he wasn't fooled into thinking they had come from the southern Mexican state. Hola, Tapachula, Angela replied. She didn't seem to believe he was from where he had claimed either. With the few words the boy had spoken, Jaime couldn't figure out where he came from, but was willing to bet it wasn't anywhere in Mexico. A coxman, he corrected with a wink of his green eyes, which stood out against his dark features. Of course, Jaime had forgotten that this boy had been the first one the guard interrogated, the one who had had the easiest time convincing the guard he was local. Looking at him, Jaime understood why. The boy was wearing a white-collared uniform shirt from a school in Tapachula. The school's emblem bright over the left breast with the name encircling it. Good disguise. Jaime wondered how, he, how much he had paid for that shirt. The teen smiled perfectly white and even teeth as he continued. Have you been to Veracruz? I hear it's beautiful. Jaime raised his eyebrows. This guy was repeating what Angela had told the guard. What else did this guy know about them, and should they be worried? Angela stood her ground, though her cheeks flushed. Well, I feel sorry for anyone who comes from a coxman. The guy grinned as if he and Angela had been communicating in a secret language only the two of them understood. Zavi, Angela. They kissed on the right cheek in greeting. The second boy, small and scrawny, but with a few dark, wispy chin hairs, adjusted his ball cap before kissing her too. I'm Rafa. The third boy was Jaime's age, maybe a bit younger. His shirt hung like a tarp to mid-thigh and his hair looked like he'd cut it himself. This boy kept his distance. Jaime would have done the same. While it was fine to accept greeting or farewell kisses, often forced upon by his mama's friends, it was weird to think of kissing girls his age. The youngest boy shuffled his feet but barely raised his eyes to say his name. Joaquin. Jaime introduced himself and the five set to work. Washing dishes for 100 people was no easy task. Washing dishes for 100 people with no running water and clogged plumbing, eternal. Water was hauled up from the river, sterilized with lime juice, which first had to be squeezed, and dumped back outside once it got too dirty. Jaime and Joaquin were in charge of drying and putting away the plates. Jaime had offered to wash the dishes, but Angela volunteered instead, saying she could do them faster, which was true. The other two were on water hauling duty. Between buckets, they started to get to know each other. The other three boys had just met that morning at breakfast. Mi madre in Honduras. She drinks a lot. Rafa spilled his life story without being asked, almost as if he were bragging. We never have enough food. She's pretty too, so she has lots of boyfriends. I have ten brothers and sisters. Most of them don't know who their real poppy is. Not me. I know mine's in Texas. I'm going to find him. We're going to get fat, discover oil, and become rich together. Jaime and Angela looked at each other with raised eyebrows, but said nothing to Rafa about his plan. 
It wasn't their place to ruin someone's dreams. What about you, Zavi? Angela asked when he came in with a bucket of water. Are you getting fat and rich too? Zavi laughed. I don't need to be fat and rich to be happy. Just he averted his eyes as if the idea of what he needed to be happy was painful. He took a deep breath before continuing. I just want the freedom to make my own choices and be in control of my future. I didn't have that in El Salvador. Us too, Angela said, and Jaime agreed. Had they joined the Alphas back home, their lives would never again be their own. There would have been no future to call their own. Like Zavi, they kept their story vague. No mentioning Miguel. It felt safer to keep personal details minimal. At least the details that could come back and hurt them. Joaquin said nothing, except that he came from Honduras too. They were almost done when Zavi hauled out the dirty water. His arm muscles cut against his dark skin, and Angela pulled Jaime close. I need a favor, Angela muttered as she looked out the kitchen into the thick vegetation surrounding the shelter. On the flattened undergrowth that marked a path to the river, Rafa was returning with not as dirty river water. Jaime rushed her words. When Zavi comes back, ask him how old he is. Jaime frowned. Why don't you ask him? I don't want to. Angela rolled her eyes as if she expected him to get it. Why? Angela let go of his arm, but then turned back to him and whispered even lower just as Rafa returned. Sloshing water on the floor. Just do it. Por fa. Jaime rolled his eyes back and glanced at Joaquin to see if the boy knew what Angela was talking about. But Joaquin kept his head down and dried the plates. Jaime thought he knew his cousin, but every once in a while, she went all weird. Girls. Zavi returned with the empty dishpan a few minutes later and stretched his arm over his head, his back cracking. You creak like an old man, Zavi. Jaime teased. How old are you? Sometimes I feel like a viejo, but I'm just 17. You? I'm 12. Too young to feel like an old man, he grinned and got a few chuckles from Zavi and Rafa. 17, too, Rafi volunteered. He turned to look at Angela with a grin. What about you, mamacita? Angela shook her head at Rafa in annoyance, then turned to Zavi. Dieciséis. Jaime had to bite his lip and focus on the dish he was drying. Sure, she was 16. In five months. They all turned to Joaquin, waiting for his response. Maybe it was the heat of the day, already making a sweat pour down their foreheads. But Jaime was sure Joaquin reddened just a bit before saying once. Eleven. And you're by yourself? Rafa asked. What kind of trouble are you running from? Joaquin left the kitchen, and when he came back, he had three forgotten plates in his hands, which he immediately began washing himself. Zavi picked up one of the damp rags they were using to draw the dishes and finish the task. Once that was done, the older boy placed a hand on Joaquin's shoulder. Hey, you can travel with me. The words were quiet, but the old other three still heard. We'll look after each other. Joaquin looked up, his dark eyes wide with surprise? Fear? He seemed like he wanted to say no, then changed his mind. He nodded in agreement and quickly grabbed the remaining plates from Zavi's hands to place on the shelf before leaving the kitchen. Come on, man, Rafa said in a low voice. Why'd you say that? You don't even know the kid. He's only going to slow you down or get you into trouble. Zavi didn't answer right away. He draped the dish towels over the faucet that didn't work and grabbed the broom to sweep water out of the puddle they had made on the floor. You remember that woman on the bus yesterday, he asked, the one they hauled off. Rafa hadn't been on the bus, but Jaime and Angela nodded. How could they forget the way they dragged her off and whacked her to the ground as if she had no right to seek a better life? I recognized her, Zavi said, his arms leaning against the broom handle. She was from the next village over. I lived with my grandmother. Who is La Corandera? The bus woman came over one night with a horrible black eye and fat lip. But more than something for her injuries, she asked my grandmother how to break the evil curse that caused her husband to beat her so much. It was my grandmother who said the curse was strong, and the best way to break it would be for the woman to leave her husband. I didn't recognize her until she got dragged off the bus. I don't know if it was good or not that she didn't recognize me. Zavi put the broom back where it belonged and fiddled with the stacked clean dishes, straightening them in rows, how they had color coordinated. You couldn't have saved her, Angela said softly. She reached out a hand, but then dropped it before it, it touched his shoulder. If you'd have tried to stop them, they would have taken you too. Zavi spun around, his green eyes narrowed and dark. Would you have sat by while they deported Jaime? Of course not. Her response was quick and hostile, as if he dared such a dared suggest such a thing, but we're family. And the woman left hers because of mine. Those guards will probably treat her worse than her husband did. I may wish he could have helped her too, but not if it would have gotten him or Angela into trouble. But at what point do you stop helping people? He and Angela had grown up together. His mama had taken care of her and Miguel while Tia worked. They were practically brother and sister. 
He'd like to think he'd helped anyone in his family if he could. But what about family members he didn't know or friends? Where would he draw the line between those he'd help and those he'd get abused? He'd let get abused or deported. But they said they were only going to take her back to Guatemala. She can come back to Mexico and try her journey again, Jaime said, grabbing the only optimism he could from the grim situation. If she has the strength or the money, Zavi reminded them, would you? Angela shook her head sadly. Home's not safe for us anymore. But neither is this trip. Zavi turned back to Rafa, daring him to question his motives again. That's why Joaquin is coming with me.